Welcome. My name is Betsy Johnson. Um, I'm an assistant curator at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC. And I am so honored to be here today on behalf of College Chapel with an esteemed group of panelists to discuss their artistic practices within the context of today's Darshan panel. Um, and so the overarching theme, of course, of these sessions is Darshan, which can be translated as sight or perception. The panel today is organized under a subcategory, Nyanya, which is one of the six systems of Indian philosophy, which aims to end ignorance of reality through right knowledge. Nyaya posits that human suffering is the result of mistakes produced under actions driven by wrong knowledge. And moksha, or liberation from this suffering, can only be gained is under um, a further title, cultural meaning in the landscape. And we're going to be interpreting landscape quite broadly here to reflect the various landscapes that we're all finding ourselves enmeshed in, whether they be personal, historical, political, geographical, theoretical, linguistic, or otherwise. And within those landscapes, we're going to be examining the role that art plays in the generation of meaning by helping us to interpret and understand the world around us. The panelists joining me today come from different parts of the world and have disparate backgrounds, yet they're all involved in what I would call a reckoning with the past in the present. They use their artistic practices to create objects and spaces that catalyze collective memory and help us see our, under our surroundings more clearly. Toronto-based architect Robert Jan van Pelt will describe a project that he undertook to ensure that the atrocities of the Holocaust cannot be denied, despite Nazi attempts to erase traces of their crimes and Holocaust deniers who still today dismiss the legitimacy of survivor accounts. Chicago-based artist Bethany Collins will share her close examination of language and the processes that she employs to expose the contradictory and often insidious layers of meaning that lie within even the most beautiful texts. And to round us out, Delhi-based artist Fir Munshi will explain how he's employed his practice to stay connected to his homeland while, by honoring its traditions, mourning its tragedies, and supporting its people while he is living in exile. I want to thank Helen Frederick and Lenica Jacob and everybody at College Chapel for supporting this panel. And without further ado, I want to introduce the very first presentation. So Robert Jan van Pelt was born in the Netherlands and has taught at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture since 1987. The focus of his research has been the architectural history of Auschwitz in particular and history of the Holocaust in general. He's been active in the struggle against Holocaust denial and served as an expert witness for the defense in the libel case Irving versus Penguin in Lipstadt in 2000, you can, using architectural forensic evidence presented at trial to show how Auschwitz was transformed into a systematic factory for mass murder, Van Pelt worked with a team from the University of Waterloo, including architects Donald McKay and Anne Bordelow and curator Sasha Hastings to create the evidence room an installation that serves as a space for contemplating and remembering the horrors of the Holocaust. Initially commissioned for the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale, the evidence room has since been exhibited at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto and the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC. So please join me in welcoming Robert Jan. All uh, hear me now. Um, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to speak to all. I'm going to share some slides and I hope that will work. And this room um, is, um, is a project that, as Betsy said, was, uh, was started, um, uh, was created in uh, 2016 for the Venice Biennale, but its real origins are in one of the most lethal landscapes that humanity has produced, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, these are the remains of Auschwitz-Birkenau, photos taken in December of 2012. Uh, and this uh, is a place where um, over 1.3 million people, mostly Jews, were brought and over 1.1 million uh, uh, people, uh, mostly Jews, were murdered here in, in gas chambers. And here you see the remains of the gas chambers of crematorium number two. And here a, uh, an, an, a picture with the statistics. You see that the uh, 
the largest victim group in Auschwitz were Jews, and around 90% uh, of the Jews who arrived in Auschwitz were murdered. And the second largest group were Polish non-Jews, of whom half were murdered, and then smaller uh, groups of Roma, Sinti, Soviet POWs, and others, all in all 1.1 million people lost their lives in this relatively small place. Already during the Second World War, when uh, stories, uh, when the information about Auschwitz reached the outside world, a few people wanted to believe it. They referred to the First World War when uh, there were stories going around in England about the Germans creating factories in which uh, dead soldiers were made into soap. And they were proven to be uh, wrong after the, after the war. And so uh, when the stories about Auschwitz reached the West in 1942-43, people said they're just like the atrocity propaganda from the First World War. However, in early 1944, two inmates, Rudi Wurba and Alfred Wetzler, were able to escape from Auschwitz and brought a detailed report about the genocide unfolding in that camp uh, to the world, inclusive it also included plans of the crematoria. Uh, the problem with those plans were because they'd never been inside one of those crematoria that after the war they were proven to be wrong. This is a real plan of the basement uh, level of one of the crematoria with uh, the gas chambers. This is crematorium number two, in which over 500,000 people were murdered. So in the 1970s, Holocaust deniers like Robert Faurisson, a denier from France, started to use the discrepancy between the reports about Auschwitz created during the war and the remains and documents that were basically inspected after the war to sow doubt about the historical veracity of the genocide that had happened there. In 1988, Faurisson sent an uh, American engineer named Fred Leuchter to the site in Auschwitz to do a forensic investigation. And uh, Leuchter came back after two days on the site, not having visited the archives or done for that matter any historical study, and said that on the basis of the inspection of the ruins, he had come to the conclusion that no gassings had taken place in Auschwitz, that it all was a hoax. Also, um, Leuchter did some uh, testing of the blue stains in the cyanide delousing rooms in Auschwitz, which were not used to kill prisoners, and came to the conclusion that because there were no blue stains in the homicidal gas chambers, in the remains thereof, that again, those chambers had never seen any gas, and so they were fake. Um, so this, uh, this, this uh, in some way, the, the Holocaust deniers started to deny the whole of the Holocaust because they so doubt about Auschwitz, the most lethal and most central site of the Holocaust. Uh, in 1988, a uh, British historian named David Irving jumped on the bandwagon of denial and basically endorsed the Leuchter report. Uh, because he had a reputation as a historian, uh, an a American historian named Deborah Lipstadt identified him as a very dangerous Holocaust denier because Irving basically had a good reputation as a historian of the Second World War. And so she wrote a book called Denying the Holocaust that was published in 1993 in which she identified Irving as the most dangerous of Holocaust deniers. Uh, she called him an anti-Semite and a liar. Of course, Holocaust denial is essentially a lie. Uh, Irving decided to sue her in a British court for libel, and in the, because the Leuchter report and the forensic analysis of the Auschwitz remains were central in the case, I was asked to join the case uh, because I had published in 1996 a history of Auschwitz, and I was supposed to be a, um, a specialist uh, in the matter. And so, uh, in order to prepare my testimony in the case, I started to first of all look at all of the forensic investigations that were done in Auschwitz in 1944, 45, and 46. Yeah. The investigations done by both the, the Red Army and by Polish and court yeah. officials, which also produced uh, photos, for example, well, here of a gas tight door. Yeah. And uh, 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 both sides here is the victim side. Uh, peepholes that were protected by a special uh, by special wire mesh uh, in order that the victim could not break through the glass. 
I went through of all the interviews that had been done in 45 for surviving Zonder commandos that worked in the crematoria, looked at reconstructions that had been done at that time. You see here to the left, the underground undressing room, to the right, the gas chamber, and then the ovens, piazza uh, on the top right and um, started to make my own reconstructions in which I focused special attention on the so-called gas columns that were the, uh, the, the, the um, instruments through which the gas that came as a crystal form, as a zyklon, were introduced from the ceiling, from the roof, into the gas chamber. And here you have a section uh, of my reconstruction of those gas columns. The problem, however, with the historical evidence was that the original blueprints did not show those gas columns. They were only introduced afterwards. So I introduced a lot of forensic uh, uh, evidence about, uh, about what could be seen on photos made in the time. Uh, also American air photos created in 1944. Uh, here particularly looking at crematorium number three. Uh, show a detail of that where uh, you can see uh, the four tops of the gas columns uh, which are indicated by the arrows and then compare them to a drawing made by a surviving Zonderkommando slave working in the crematorium who had not seen those air photos and who indicated those gas columns in the same kind of zigzag pattern. So there was a convergence of evidence. Irving was very interested in the uh, arrangement or in, 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 in the, these air photos you see behind him, uh, there's a photo from uh, the year 2000, a big photo of the ruins of that gas chamber because he claimed that uh, these gas columns had never existed. And one of the things that we had to do for the case was actually to do a forensic investigation of the ruined uh, roof of the gas chamber in order to find the remains of those holes. I mean, there were holes everywhere, the holes through which those gas columns emerged into the open air. So here we have a photo where we basically have identified four of those holes. So I created a book, The Case for Auschwitz, uh, about the case, uh, the, the case in the court, and it was published in 2002. And in 2000, um, 15, I got an uh, email from uh, Alejandro Aravena, who had read the book, so this is 13 years later, and he had just been appointed as uh, curator of the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale. He offered me a room indicated in yellow in the International Pavilion to create something that uh, became known as the Evidence Room. And the idea was, he said, I want you in some way to create a presentation of the forensic work you did about Auschwitz. Now, I'm a student of Francis Yates, Dame Francis Yates. Uh, the art of memory was a very important uh, uh, kind of point of reference in the work that we were going to do, the Renaissance Memory Theatres. Um, uh, this is one that was created in Venice by Giulio, Giulio Camillo. Um, an important point of reference were evidence rooms that exist in almost every police precinct uh, uh, where evidence of the crimes is kept. And so we decided to create a room. The we, um, uh, the first, uh, my first collaborator, Donald Mackay, a colleague at the University of Waterloo, he photographed in Venice. Donald conceived of a room that would center on three monuments. The three monuments were a gas door, as had been found in 1945 in Auschwitz, uh, a gas hatch to the right with the ladder. Uh, this was uh, of a primitive gas chamber, and then finally that gas column that was so important in the 2000 case, of which none survived. They would be placed in a room where they would be surrounded by plaster casts of the blueprints and the letters and all the other evidence that I had used in, uh, in the court. And finally, they were going to be uh, pulled together by a roof so that it really would be like a single room. Here we have uh, some of the drawings. And um, I was basically, the, my first task was to raise money. It was quite an expensive project. Uh, so I went out to, uh, to beg for money while well, we assembled a team of students at the University of Waterloo to basically uh, make this, this room in, in a four months period. Um, the gas column was being produced. Uh, 
the gas door was being created and the plaster casts of all the drawings and blueprints were being made. After four months, the evidence room was packed in some 12 boxes, shipped from Canada, it was winter, to Venice, where it was installed at the Biennale. And here we have the last photo. We've just cleaned the room and we had a little camera that took every minute a, uh, a photo. So this is the last photo of the construction. And this is the evidence room on the day of the opening, completely white, um, uh, in some way, of course, the white of Melville's, of the, of the white whale, the color in, in a sense of horror. Now, very important in the evidence room are the casts. The cast were the work of my colleague Anne Bordolo and her students. And the idea of the casts, their walls are covered with the cast of these, of these pieces of evidence, but they're three-dimensional, white on white. And of course, go back to the importance of casts in forensic analysis, that you take the cast of the, of the footprint, or you take a cast uh, of when somebody, when a corpse has been found, you create a death mask so that you can preserve the evidence of who, who was murdered. Or of course, in the case of Pompeii, the casts that were made in the 19th century of those who had died, both people and animals. The casts, of course, also uh, go back to a tradition, 19th century tradition of preserving uh, works of art like the cast court at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And so the cast became an, an, an environment uh, that in some way provide the evidence for the existence of those three monuments that are at the center. Uh, here we have a photo that I was used in the trial. It shows crematorium two on the construction. Then various attempts that were made to basically create a cast form of a two dimensional object. And so we have the photo here again. And after many different trials and errors, we came to a cast that looks like this. I mean, you have to analyze in some way the photo, how do you actually represent a two-dimensional black and white image, three-dimensionally and white on white. The architects of Auschwitz, the casts of the architect of Auschwitz. Three different de uh, developments in the design of the doors of the gas chambers, which allowed me during the trial to conclude that the gas chambers had been adapted for genocidal purposes. A section of the crematorium drawn in 1945 by a surviving Sonderkommando and the cast of it. The idea was that people could touch it, that actually the whole idea was that this is a place where you're invited to touch the art. And, uh, uh, and of course, the way you learn through your fingertips is very different from the way you learn by your eyes. It's much more intimate. So, as I said before, the evidence room refers back to evidence rooms of police stations. It refers back to the gas chambers in Auschwitz, both homicidal and delousing gas chambers, to the courtroom in London where the case was fought, to the plaster courts, for example, in the Victoria and Albert Museum, to the memory theaters of Giulio Camillo and the Renaissance, and ultimately to the room of our imagination, and most importantly, to basically the room inside the head of the architect who designed Auschwitz, Walter de Jaco. When I, for the first time, walked in the, in the evidence room, the lights were on, I felt I was in the brain of this man. So it's ultimately about the architects. It is about the design of an instrument of a tool of genocide. So to end my story, um, the evidence room uh, is a kind of a, a remarkable uh, piece of art simply for its historical location. I don't know if it's successful aesthetically, most people think so, but I will not judge about it. But I certainly realized that when we made it, that in some way we made a kind of big uh, leap in the, in the history of monument making. For most of history, uh, communities have created monuments to their heroes, like here King Frederick of Prussia. 
Much more recently, we have started to create monuments to victims like the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. We have never really made monuments to the perpetrators. Here in Berlin, we have an exhibition center about the SS and the role of the Gestapo in the history of the Third Reich. But they are only informational pieces inside. They are not celebrated by quote unquote art. The evidence room is the first time in history, I think, that perpetrators were honored. I mean, people who are recognized by the makers of this room as perpetrators of genocide were honored with quote unquote, a memorial. And of course, in the discussions today in the United States about and other countries about who is going to be honored with statues in what way, this might be a relevant precedent. So of course, since the evidence room opened, we've had uh, the issue of fake news, of lies, of denial have taken center stage. So in some way, the evidence room have remained quite relevant, sadly, today. But thank God, its future is being preserved by the Evidence Room Foundation. Here is the opening page of their website that has uh, taken over the Evidence Room. It preserves it and also has made it available for exhibition in, in any place that is willing to take it. And so this is how we also got it into the Hirschhorn Museum. And so this is where I am to check the Evidence Room uh, Foundation and you will get all the information you ever would want about this project. Thanks very much. Thank you, Robert Yan. Um, now I would like to introduce our second panelist, Bethany Collins. Bethany Collins is a multidisciplinary artist who was born in Montgomery, Alabama. She earned a BA in studio art and visual journalism from the University of Alabama and an MFA in drawing and painting from Georgia State University. Her conceptually driven work explores the intersectionality of race and language, mining dictionaries, hymns, literature, newspapers, court documents, and archives, among other things, for texts that expose the ways in which language is inherently racialized. She puts these found texts through um, highly physical processes of reproduction and erasure, sometimes obfuscation, laying bare their essential contradictions. She was an artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem in 2013 to 14, and has had solo exhibitions at the Birmingham Museum of Art and the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis. She is currently based in Chicago, where she teaches at the University of Chicago. Hi, Bethany. Thank you, Betsy. Well, it's nice to join you all today, even if just digitally. I wanted to share a few, um, a few different series that touch on the similar ideas. All of my work is language-based. Language is the subject of my work. It's also my primary material. I've found that language, um, lang I believe in language. Language has the capacity that if we can find similar words, that there is nothing that we cannot communicate and know about one another. And simultaneously, language um, in opposition to that capacity is doomed to fail. As an extension of us, as a human creation, it's bound to fail. And struggling between that um, inherent capacity and inherent failure is often the reason that I'm making. It's why I come back to language over and over again. I am also, though, thinking a lot recently about home. Um, I heard someone say, so I look to the language of others to make sense of any particular moment. And right after the 2016 presidential election, one of the snippets that I picked up on was that in times of crisis, we turn towards home, if not in body, then at least in, in our thoughts. And what does it mean to, um, to belong to a place that doesn't always claim you back? So a lot of the works that I wanted to share with you revolve around those ideas of home and belonging um, and claiming and loss. So thinking about crisis, one of the first works that I made right after the 2016 presidential election was America, a hymnal. Uh, this is my book. I deal a lot with language, but it's the language of others. This is, I consider, is my text. So America, a hymnal is made up of 100 versions of My Country, Tis of Thee. My Country, Tis of Thee is then a contrafactum. This was a much more early American common practice. Early American songbooks were full of contrafacta. 
So contrafacta are songs that retain the same melody. The melody is constant over time, but the lyrics shift and are rewritten, usually for different political purposes. So My Country Tis of Thee, then the version that we know was actually written in 1831 by Samuel Smith, sung by the Boston Children's Choir for the first time. That's the version we know. But the melody of My Country Tis of Thee is actually the same melody for six other national anthems. And the song that we know is actually then rewritten at least a hundred times after Samuel Smith's version for the suffrage movement, temperance and prohibition, the labor union, um, abolitionist, and even the Confederacy. And so I bound a hundred of these versions of My Country Tis of Thee together into one text. And in that way, a hundred versions forced into one text for me represent um, a kind of a forever kind of uh, that you must abide your own contradictions. It's a hundred versions bound together forever, always in disagreement. Also though, for this hymnal, I burned the musical notation away. So whatever was holding these different versions together is now absent and only the hundred disagreeing um, versions remain forever abiding in their own contradictions. This then was a way for me to make sense of that post 2016 pres US presidential election moment when it felt like what was holding us together was now gone and only our disagreements remained present. It is also those a kind of thread within my practice to look to the past to make sense of this of now. This work is the Birmingham News from 1963. And again, I'm looking through archives of the, of the past to make sense of a particular social or political moment. So this work is also post-2016 presidential election. I'm originally from Montgomery, Alabama. So Birmingham is not that far. The Birmingham News editorial board in 1963 made a decision um, not to publish any civil rights stories on their cover pages for fear of inciting violence. And so even when the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times was publishing above the fold, multiple photographs of the civil rights protests and demonstrations and arrests, police dogs and fire hoses used on protesters, hundreds of children filling the Birmingham jails. The Birmingham News reported on Sophia Loren was sick in bed and couldn't get to her movie shoot. They sent a reporter to the zoo and had multiple photographs of a reporter petting a python, a snake wrapped around its neck. None of the actual story was present. The Washington Post, the LA Times, the New York Times, even the Montgomery Advertiser, where I'm from, reported on these stories. Two blocks from the Birmingham News, from the actual offices of the Birmingham News, the editorial board decided not to publish any stories. And so for this work, I actually went through the Birmingham Library archives and found the old microfiche, microfilm, um, of these cover pages of the Birmingham News from the spring of 1963 and looked for particular cover pages where uh, a moment of violence happened, state violence against civil rights protesters. And I retyped and relayed out these pages uh, and then embossed them. So emboss is a process by which you and I engraved this text of the cover page into a plexi plate, engraved it backwards, and then you soak a piece of paper until it becomes just malleable enough, place that paper on top of that engraved backwards text and run it through the printing press. And when you lift it up, the paper is now, that text is protruding from the surface. It acts as a kind of braille, except for, us, for me still legible. And so similar, I think, to Robert's work in the plaster cast, there is this sense of a kind of haunting, haunting nature of the text, that it is present and invisible simultaneously. It's an inkless printing process. It's not actually there, and yet it's embedded in the very structure of, for my case, the paper. I also, though, because I made this after the election, I embossed them twice. So I repeated that process twice. Uh, soaking the paper, registering it on top, running it through the press, lifting it up and doing that again. And because the paper is a little bit more frail, it actually doesn't um, hold up as well the second time. It falls apart. 
And so each of the papers started to fall apart in their own way. And this was my way of wondering, not so optimistically, whether the institution itself would hold up into this repeated assault and this repetition of the past and a particular kind of American violence. So I revisited this process in Do You Know Them from 1898. And I made this work after the family separation crisis at the border. So for these works, I looked to the archive of classified ads that were posted, printed in black newspapers shortly before the beginning of, or the end of the Civil War, all the way up until the 1920s. And these ads were posted by formerly enslaved people looking for their family. What's interesting is because not everybody could read at the time and not everybody could get a paper at the time, often these were read from the pulpits of churches. And so that recitation of how the ad or how the questioning looking for your family member was asked started to become a kind of chorus through time. And so over time, I started to notice the ways that people would look for their loved ones was by asking, do you know them? Have you seen her? Can you help me to find my people? Will the ministers of the South please read this from your pulpits? That was the introduction, this kind of um, longing and loss embedded in the question of looking for your family. The ads then were actually um, sometimes fairly short, often fairly short. It was everything that you could remember about your loved one, maybe a scar, the name by which they went under, multiple names depending on who was asking. Uh, the plantation name, a former owner, everything you could remember about a person in one classified ad. And because I made these after the family separation crisis at the border, I returned to that process of twice embossing. And the paper, again, doesn't hold up under that process the second time. These, for me, different than the Birmingham News, are much more like love letters. They are about loss and love and longing for one's, for one's kin. And whether that will actually result in any kind of reunion is fairly much up in doubt. It rarely did. The last works that I wanted to show you are differently also about home and what it means to belong to a place. So in 2017, the first, this is a little bit different, the first translation of the Odyssey by a woman into English is finally published, Emily Wilson. And I remember looking for these works, I was actually looking, reading a lot of post-apocalyptic literature, I was looking for the language of the end, the end of things, how do you say that the world has ended, but we're still here to write about it. But I eventually came to the Odyssey, in particular looking at book 13. When Odysseus, you know, this text of exile and homecoming and strangeness among intimates felt like it might get me closer to understanding that post-election moment. And so in book 13, Odysseus, after 20 years of searching for his homeland, 20 years crying and weeping on every false shore that he lands on, finally returns to his country, his place, and doesn't recognize the place. And that finally felt like a way to talk about that post-election moment in America. What's also interesting though is the first woman to translate the Odyssey, she got a lot of press for that particular um, biographical kind of um, interest about her translation and how her translation might be different and it, and it a little bit is. So what she often mentions is the first line of the Odyssey that she translates so distinctly from others. There's a, a word in the first the first book, the first line, it's polytropus. When we're trying to understand who is this man before we follow him on this epic journey home. And this one word has been translated at least 36 different ways in 60 different translations, positive to negative. He's cunning or crafty, mischievous, adventurous. He's a hero, just a man. He is tossed to and fro by fate. The language is not settled law. Emily Wilson finally translates this line to say, mm, he's a complicated man. And in one word, she manages to embody everything that came before her. He is a hero and he is cunning and he is tossed to and fro by fate and he's really complicated. And that felt, I felt some sort of understanding about us 
thinking back to America, hymnal, and us in that moment, that we can embody 36 different ways of being in one word. And so for this series, I actually looked through different translations of the Odyssey, mm, narrowing it down to about 15 different translations. And I focused on book 13, when Odysseus finally gets home and does not recognize his place of origin. And then I compared translations. So in this work from the Odyssey, from a translation from 1815 versus 1980, the question shifts from what land is this, what people, what men are born here, to what country, what land is this, who are the people that dwell in it? What men are born here is what we ask in 1852. What we ask in 1980 is who are the people who dwell in it? And those, though they're from the same Greek, they're very different questions. The process for this work then is that I rewrite the entire text and then use spit to erase it. And so the illegibility of the text is my attempt to physically understand it, to make it physically manifest, and then also to exert some control over it as well. This is the last work that I wanted to show you. And I'll just read the different translations from 2000. And then Emily Wilson's version is on the right from 2017. It was his homeland he missed as he paced along the whispering surf line, utterly forlorn. So weeping for his homeland, he went limping along the shore of the loud roaring sea with many a groan. The whispering surf line, the loud roaring sea, is from the same origin text and yet constantly in disagreement and contradiction to itself. And that for me is a way to understand it is why I continue to come back to language. Its capacity and its utter and inherent failure feels very much like a reflection of us at any given moment. And so to understand this moment, I come back to the text over and over again. Thank you. You. Sorry, <laughs> can you all hear me now? Okay, thank you, Bethany. Um, and so lastly, I want to introduce Veer Munshi, our third panelist. Veer Munshi was born in Srinagar, Kashmir, and studied fine arts at the MS University, Baroda. He was forced to flee Kashmir in 1990 and has since resided in Delhi. He consistently um, has used his art to reflect on his experience as an exiled refugee, first transforming his memories and emotions into painting and later expanding into other media such as sculpture, photography, video, and installation to create work that highlights the turmoil that comes with his separation from his heritage and the increasingly narrow space that exists for culture and art in his homeland. He is convinced that art's universal nature will allow it to play a significant role in the resolution of conflict in Kashmir and has spearheaded collaborative projects with artists and poets in the region. He has received many honors, including a national award and senior fellowship from the Government of India's Ministry of Culture. Welcome, Beer. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Helenica, Helen, to have invited me here. Thanks, Betsy, for a wonderful moderating session. And I really am intrigued with these two presentations from my fellow panelists. Oh, I am conscious while speaking in these unfortunate times that we are passing through a phase of uncertainty. While as art continues to inspire and give perspective to the human conditions in the times of disaster. Well, my art practice is connected to my personal experience for the last three decades. Ever since I had to leave my home state, Kashmir, due to political upsurge. Besides my personal studio practice, I sought my work with more inclusiveness that engages with artists, writers, craftsmen, and other activists of our society. Some of the projects emerged from this practice referred to an exhibition held in Srinagar in 2017 where art meant to connect communities which are polarized because of religion and politics in present times. And this was very challenging exhibition at that time, the vulnerability of the place. 
participating artists in this project were those who had left the valley in 90s and never returned in two or three decades. And also those who were born in conflict and who are affected with the same. Which also led to the, another project, curatorial project called Srinagar Benale, titled A Place for Repose at Kochi Benale. The work comprised of large structure shrine Darga, while borrowing elements from the local Kashmiri architecture with intricate traditional wood carving into which the audience can walk in. A Sufi shrine is perhaps where one can hold on to one's sense of self. It is surrounded by various experiences and expressions of the artists are as varied as multiple mediums and practices. You may witness a loss of young lives that an unresolved war invariably represents and hand-painted caskets in the local popular craft paper mache to signify the zone it comes from of activities, identity, migration or displacement. Another project titled, We are inside the fire looking for the dark was shown in Serendipity in Goa in 2018. It brings together the voices of Kashmiri poetess from 14th century to present. Some of them are very popular and have been sung by various singers and other orators over the time, like Lal Death and presently Aga Shahid Ali, like Mantu, to Shari Kashmir Majur and Iqbal and Dinada Nadi. How does the poetic voices reach out of and above untold and untellable suffering, strife and horror? Oh, sorry, it's getting backwards. So. This image is from my Shrapnel series. Uh, these are series of drawings on handmade paper, pasted on board, led me to do, to build chamber at various galleries as per the specification of size. It varied at different places as per the size and the dimensions. It comes from my personal experience in conflict where one sees the landscape changing with day-to-day -day rift. It is a video running inside. Pandit Houses is an ongoing photographic archive. It presents stark documentary evidence presented without manipulation or theatricality. Stands of its own, these houses are left behind by the community, fleeing into exile. Stands in our line of sight as ruins, monuments, memories. My periodic visits took me to these sites to document these photographs of houses, which were familiar to me with a lot of memories attached. This task was doubly complicated, one to restrain from inflating own suffering and other memory of culture, cultural lifestyle that has been irretrievably lost. These abandoned houses have vernacular architecture of medieval times, needs to be restored, declared as, herit as heritage. Becomes the role of activism, which now I was looking for so that one can save the cultural history of time as they are decaying fast after changing hands, turning into glass, steel malls and shopping complexes. To add salt to the wounds, nature dealt its own blow with massive floods never seen before in the valley 2014 and number of houses which needed to be protected as heritage disseminated with floods which led me to do this installation 
titled Serenity of Dissolution, which was shown in India Art Fair 2015. Lastly, I would like to show a small video which is called Leaves Like Hands of Flame. Thank you, Veer. Is that is that the end of your presentation then? I think yeah. that's a really beautiful way um, to kind of wrap this up and start off this conversation then between these panelists. Um, yeah. This idea kind of watching this, um, watching you move through the landscape, seeking something you've lost, you know, seeking the sense of home, seeking something that no longer exists, um, kind of existing outside of your homeland. And not only that, having um, the home that you grew up in, um, no longer there, burnt down, um, and this sort of this process of journeying to reclaim it in some way, I think resonates very strongly um, with Bethany's work and the way she talks about home and um, trying trying to find out what it means for her to belong to a place that doesn't always claim you back. Um, and I think there's something that, that unites those works, but then there's also something that ties into, you know, what Robert Yawn is doing as well in trying to make something that's no longer visible that visible again to kind of bring it back into visibility. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, it seems, that there is a, a strong communicative element to all of your practices. Like you are trying to gather gather information that maybe doesn't exist in the world in, in the way that helps you understand it. So you're processing it and putting it out there. Um, and, and I guess my question is, um, is, is education or is sharing that information with others a really important part of your process? And why is art the vehicle that you want to use to do that? Because art isn't always an easy way to communicate, right? It's not, you're not necessarily handing it to people in, um, in a clear cut language. Like it is something that 
um, that people who come to it also have to struggle with, right? They have to struggle to kind of uh, to understand what you're communicating. And so I think I think there um, I I would really invite you all to kind of respond to um, to the media that you are choosing, the um, the mode that you're choosing to convey this information and why um, why it is the um, why why you feel like this is this is the medium that is most effective kind of for you or what you hope people will glean from it. I don't know if, if anybody can, feels can like they want to respond. I mean, maybe I can maybe I can start with okay. that because yeah. I'm actually not an artist, so I would never have described myself. I'm a historian. And it was really my colleagues, I mean, Anne and, and Donald and, and the students and Sasha who made this into a, let's call it a work of art, if you want to call it like that. But I think that one of the, I think one of the uh, important things to remember is that, uh, you know, today we're talking about evidence a lot uh, because of fake news, because of the, uh, because we're surrounded more and more by what we recognize as manufactured lies. And I think that that it's very important to remember that evidence is complicated. And the first reason it's complicated is it, it never screams at you, I'm evidence. Yeah. Anything can be evidence. Uh, and so uh, so what what the first thing that you need to that you need to to um, to to realize when you deal with any kind of you want to in some way test a hypothesis or back up a statement with evidence is that you need to have patience. Yeah. The second thing is that you need to build up a connoisseurship of uh, you know in a certain sense, which of course in relationship to art, when we talk about a connoisseur, we always think about actually a connoisseur of art. You know, we uh, of course it exists in, in almost any other field, but to somebody, the art connoisseur has become the symbol of connoisseurship. And so I think that what what we try to do, and what uh, and what I think I see also in the works of Bethany and Fear, is that the first thing that that we ask people to do is to slow down, and to realize quote unquote to 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 quote the other say and Bethany, it's complicated. Yeah. And of course that is something that is that is incredibly lacking today. And and, and not only in the media and the world out there in the White House or but even in universities, where if we look at what's happening today and the social revolution that we are dealing with, that in some way when you start out by saying it's complicated and let's look at the evidence, immediately you are, you are seeing as if you're kind of slowing down too much, something that needs to be changed, you know, within, within the next 24 hours. And so I think that if, if, if there was something that I think we did uh, achieve in the evidence room was because you come in, you can't see anything, it's all white. And only when you are, very, when you are there for a time, you start moving your body and you see the shadows that are actually creating the lines, the shadows that are draw that are thrown by the by the elevation, you know, like the embossed uh, newspapers in Bethany's work, is that only very slowly you start to realize where the, the evidence might be located. Yeah. So the teasing out, the forensic teasing out, uh, can then begin, but nothing is given to you immediately. And I think that is for any artwork uh, a, a key a key of what makes it ultimately into a mystery. Uh, so right as the pandemic was starting and everything was shutting down here in Chicago, um, I got a few interview requests and the questions seemed to be, you know, like, are you still making work? And what can you say about this moment? I was like, I have nothing to say about this moment. For one thing I need in my practice, I need the language of others to make sense of a moment. Um, and so I was waiting for others to like say what we are doing, what is happening here so that I could then, as Robert was saying, like mine through that archive slowly and look for the ways, look for the disagreements and the complications and what doesn't feel like it actually reflects in this official, you know, tome of, of who we are and what we are in a moment doesn't actually feel as truthful as it could be. 
but um, what I, and so I was envious actually of artists who it felt like they were responding really quickly to the now. Cause it's not something that I can do. I need the archive to like look backwards and then make sense of this, of the present. And so um, I think what I can do, like why, yeah, I think what my practice is doing then is, is maybe sifting through this moment so that if we get through it to the other side, people can look back and make sense of it, right? I feel like I am, if that's some sort of optimistic um, gesture, then it is for the future to look back at this moment. It's not actually to like get through the now. There's nothing about art right now that feels like survival to me. It is about a kind of projecting into what may be next. Uh, can I say something? No. Mm, please do. I, I, I agree with Bethany because once you're in a conflict, I've been in the conflict, you don't really produce works. It grows in your, uh, it grows under your skin. And at one point it gets transformed through whatever medium you choose, whatever. It, but it happened. But in my case, in earlier, when I migrated to the place, when I had to leave the place, it was many months I could not talk. Or when I talked to the people, it was not understood. There was no social media. It didn't become a news like it becomes today, the pandemic. So, uh, but then this became the only means of communication because I was very much inward, uh, moving inwards. And uh, the work painting, that time painting became my only release. It was more personal cathars. I didn't call it art also because it was releasing me. Business, there was no nobody to talk to and nobody will understand because it happened to one particular very small community and when you, you come to a larger space you it gets diluted in a huge ocean so the communication doesn't so it becomes very particular catharsis and how do you, you said how do you choose the mediums it's every medium is a possibility and limitation when i was doing these houses i thought i will i was not a photographer i never touched camera in that sense so I, I thought I will scribble and paint or, but I thought it will be my interpretation to it. It didn't turn. So the photography became the medium which I felt would speak of what I felt that time. That's how it happens. Like I, even presently, as Bethany says, there's so much of happening things, but it's growing in us. So maybe at one point it might, it may, it may not transfer in some way or the other. That's how I feel like so. And the evidence is very important. Like I am uh, very intrigued with this Jew uh, uh, evidence of this after the, your third generation or second generation. Still, you are holding to it and showing it and uh, making archival yet another layer of archival for next to next to next to generations. That's why it's important to build an archival material. I didn't realize in '90 what I did, but it is today's archival material for who have not seen. A migration of that time, that exodus happened at that time. So I think these are very important for practices to do and and this epidemic will surely, because it touched everybody, it will surely transfer us. It will be a different world and there will be many things. There will be a lot of change. There will be a lot of issues when we'll be connected and, you know, we'll be working seriously on it. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, the what Robert Yan was saying about, you know, this, this need to slow down. Um, I think all three of you very effectively yeah. use the space as of a gallery as a place where that work can be done by, by um, everybody who's present in that space. Um, and, and, you know, Robert Yan, you, you all have created um, a room, right? Specifically where this, uh, the archival documents are, um, are to be interacted with and, um, and where these conversations unfold. And Veer, I think, um, you know, your shrines that you create within your spaces um, also sort of encourage that kind of contemplation. But Bethany, I think, you know, I think your work shows that even the white gallery space, it doesn't, it can be a shrine in a way, you know, it can be this um, sort of contemplative contemplative space where people um, interact with it. And I know I saw a question from Helen here um, about whether or not you all have a sense that creatives have a greater moral responsibility at this moment. And I, I, what I see in all of your practices is that the, 
the moral responsibility is, is really so infused with who you all are as people and kind of your own personal journeys. There is this um, this strong um, sense that the two are, are not really separate. I don't know if any of you want to respond to that, um, but, but I also see um, that there's another question here from Lenica that says that the projects and works of all three panelists has immense physical essence and is experiential. How does one consider the impact of such works when people may be unable to touch or feel or experience physically for a long time to come? So I guess that is, you know, we are creating, we're so used to creating these spaces that we can exist within um, amongst one another. And that is a large part of what you all have done. But, um, but you know, have you, ha has this changed the way you're thinking about your practice that we are now, you know, interacting as we are here, um, where we're all sitting in separate spaces and tuning in through the, the internet? Um, now, it, it, about the evidence room, we're actually thinking of making, of, of producing a book. And, and in fact, the whole idea of the book was, and we have to, I have to talk to Bethany, is to actually include uh, a, 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 a collection of the, of what are the, uh, the, the casts as actually embossed, uh, embossed pages. Uh, so that's still uh, the experience of touching them and exploring them with your fingertips. Could be preserved, uh, but I, I must say that uh, I think you know quite often my sense with 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 anything is that you need to have a touchstone of authenticity somewhere. Uh, that in the case of Auschwitz, uh, I don't think uh, there are many people who say you you need to go once in your lifetime. You need to go to Auschwitz as if it's like for a Muslim once in a lifetime. You have to go to Mecca or maybe for a Catholic, you need to go to the Holy Sepulchre. I don't really believe that. I, but I, I believe it is very important that such a touchstone of authenticity remains available. And as long as you know that it remains available somewhere in this world, I think that we are quite capable uh, in some way, uh, and I don't want to quote Veer here in, 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 in incorrectly, or even should put something in his words, to live in exile. Yeah? And this, of course, is also what Odysseus, you know, in the end, he was able to live 20 years in exile because he had Penelope. He knew that Ithaca was still there. And so I think that that is, for me at least, so that's how we survive periods like this, because we know that there is still a world out there that's real and, and a place that 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 we can go to. Oh, that's a good answer. That's a beautiful thought. That was a good answer. <laughs> Do either of you have any any further thoughts on, you know, what it means? You know, how important is space? How important is kind of shared experience to your practice? I think about my work, <clears throat> rather I try not to think about the viewer at all. I think about um, that, it, that um, the processes that I choose are very laborious. You know, it's like rewriting these giant pages of the Odyssey or rewriting a problematic text until my hand hurts and using spit to erase, which means you can't have coffee before. It's like all of these impediments to make the text physically manifest that process for me that like laboring with the text that is for me what is in the world then is this kind of text that becomes illegible or hard and difficult to read um, it's hard on the eyes i was thinking about um robert during your presentation a piece that i did of blind emboss white on white of the ferguson report and it's a difficult text and so it should be difficult to read and the white on white acts like that cast where it bounces the light back on your eyes. And so even though it's legible, it's hard on the body. And so you understand it as the viewer, then I hope that there's something that you understand about the difficulty of that language or what's, what's trying to be communicated. But I'm also interested that the viewer is frustrated. Language is frustrating. That inherent failure of it is bothersome to me. And I want to, after I like control the language and become master of it, I want to transfer that frustration back to the viewer. And that I think is something that can happen in this moment. 
digitally. It's like the thing exists in the world, as Robert was saying, the real thing exists in the world, but that difficulty of trying to understand the thing, that still feels quite present in this new digital landscape. Vier, that's, I think that's really, um, really right. And I'm thinking, Vier, of your work that you did after the 2014 flood in Kashmir. You were, you were uh, meant to travel to Kashmir, and at that same moment, there were these uh, horrendous floods, and you lost, con you, you weren't able to make your trip. You lost all contact with people in the region you were traveling to for what was it, seven days? And in that seven days, you really relied on your memory, right? You were, yeah. you spent your time in that seven days drawing portraits of all of the people who you could remember in the region. And I'm wondering, there is something about your practice specifically that deals very directly with this experience that we're all having in some ways right now. This is something that you've been um, in some ways channeling um, for a long time. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, um, you said it like because uh, <laughs> I was to visit Kashmir with other friends, uh, but the uh, flight didn't take, up, take off and it was flood. I thought uh, Kashmir won't remain. It was such a massive flood. And we, because there was no communication, no phone, nothing. So I started remember by the memory, this connected to the memory, memorable uh, people whom I'm connected to or whom I started remembering my teacher, my shopkeeper, my barber, maybe Kashmir doesn't exist anymore. So I start painting till that period, till the communication was resumed. Then I went, of course, back to Kashmir and I got, made some video work out of it. We go mem memory in, back in the place. I see it means when you say about this uh, political happenings and the migration, I have heard these stories from my mother who has migrated in 47 from uh, north of Kashmir, south of Kashmir, north of Kashmir. And uh, these were stories for me. Like we see the, uh, we see these uh, Jew, these films, uh, Nazi films and all. So you are very disturbed. You are very, you know, uh, you, you lose the mind for a while, but then we go on with our life. But I, I would say it doesn't touch unless it, you go through the experience. It was only in 1990 when I had to go through migration, I could understand the pathos of my mother, what it means to be, you know, in that situation. So, so the layers vary like with the personal experiences. I could really, it touched me, it became very traumatic. How, then I started going back to that memory lane, what they used to tell us over the period, what kind of stories we have heard. So that made me to go back after 24 years and I took my mother back to Valley and I took her to that place where she has come from. She had not gone for 70 years. She connected to the people there and that, you know, that landscape and she told that, but that memory was so fresh in her mind of that 70 years back. She was more concerned about maybe that impressionable age. She was 15 when she had to move. Her father was killed there and other things. So her story, I again uh, heard from her in that place in front of her earlier houses, house they have left. So it was really moving. So that, that is how you go back and forth with these evidences. It's really something we one has to continue. It happens. It you continue and you create archival for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I think that's how this gas chamber will it will speak volumes after m many generations. You know, this is how artists respond to these things. That's how. It's... In the, in the break of, can, can I just add one oh, one please. thought? Uh, you know, in the wake, uh, in the wake of Auschwitz, uh, uh, after his liberation uh, from Auschwitz, there was a, uh, an ex-inmate, his name is Jean Améry, and he wrote, you know, what actually is the greatest, the, 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 the most difficult thing that he had to realize uh, uh, as he came back into the world, you know, the post-war world, the world, the normal world in which we all live. And he said, you know, the, as a survivor, you lose trust in the world. And, uh, and, and it's very difficult to live without trust in the world because, you know, in, in our routine, we need to trust the world around us. And as a survivor, you never do that again. 
and I think that one of the 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 and, and I think Emmanuel Kant already observed this in his you know third critique um, uh, that 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 what art can do is restore trust in the world you know I mean it can at least suggest that the world that there might be a moment that we trust the world again and I think that is certainly today when at every level, and I think we're all survivors today in the assault that is happening, not simply because of the disease, but also because the very issue of the, the lies that we're surrounded with, as Hannah Arendt also says, I mean, that's what totalitarian is. It's basically you live in a regime of lies. Uh, and, and so if, 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 if that's the least we can do by slowing down, by being serious, by by by, by, by ad approaching the other as a, as a reasonable and a uh, person we trust to interpret our work. Yeah. We, we're not going to spell it out. Yeah. We give it to you and we trust you with it. I think that that is probably the most important thing we can do right now. Yeah, I think, yeah. I also think that one uh, has to move beyond like, because uh, I started my practice by my experiences and my memories and, but then point comes here, does it mean a lot to the society? How does one engage with the society? I went back to the place for the reason where the problem has come from, rather than being bitter and being engaged with, you know, contradictions. It's rather to get, to get, heal the wounds, because once you understand the pain, you understand the pains of others. I think. More important is how do you get connected with the communities, engage communities, whether art reflects that, whether it changed or it becomes a usable material for ourselves. So it has many layers. I think one need to have front foot forward to work in the, within, in present pandemic, we definitely have to think of ecology and water might be the next war, water crisis. So what, are we ready for it? You know, so much one has to engage with. I see um, in the thread, I see kind of repeated questions about memory. And I think that the, that's one thing that is kind of underlying all of your practices. I, you know, the, in some ways, the fickleness of memory and the um, kind of its shifting nature. I see questions about kind of generations inheriting memories. You know, memories are in some ways emotional content that run through our cells and vibrate through our bodies. And we pass them along to the people who we live around and who come from our bodies, you know, and I think, um, you know, in some ways, maybe I'm coming around to an answer um, to my own question that I posed at the start, which is why art right why art and you know I, I suppose when language fails us um art offers us other other means of communication and i think we see that in all of your practices um so i don't know i think that this might be a good place to wrap unless unless you have final comments that you want to make no Okay, well, thank you all so much for such moving presentations and such powerful work. Um, you know, I know that I am profoundly touched by what you all are doing. <laughs>